This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by the Flower Essences Deck. Oracle cards for working with and getting to know Flower Essences by Kinsey Zara. The second deck was just released this past fall, and combined, the two decks offer over 100 different flowers, each carefully illustrated and arranged with their patterns of alignment from the Flower Essences Repertory by Patricia Kaminsky. And I can tell you, these decks are so beautiful! Both volumes 1 and 2 are available at thefloweressencesdeck.com at a sliding scale, so you can pay what you were able to using the following discount codes, 10% off, 20% off, or 30% off, and that's simply the number with the percent sign and the word off. So go on ahead to thefloweressencesdeck.com and get your decks today. Witchy Washy Bath is a handcrafted, vegan, and cruelty-free bath company providing basic bath witches with all their skincare needs. They offer a wide range of products such as whipped soaps and sugar scrubs, bath bombs and shower steamers, and even more. And you can make everyday magic easy with the Witchy Washy Bath Intentions Collection all crafted with a special intention in mind, using various herbs, oils, colors, and crystals to help aid in your magic. And last but not least, Witchy Washy Bath also offers a quarterly box called the Occult Classic Box, based on your favorite witch movies and shows. Right now, you can get your hands on this month's box based off the movie The Love Witch. Find them over on Instagram at Witchy Washy Bath or at their website www.witchywashybathco.com. The world is filled with bewitching people, and you might be one too. Welcome to the podcast where art is magic, magic is real, and reality is stranger than dreams. I'm Pam Grossman, and this is The Witch Wave. And welcome to the Witch Wave. One of the things I appreciate most about witchcraft is that it posits that magic is located not just somewhere out there, but also right here, right now in the material world. And the archetype of the witch as a subversive, insubordinate woman is one that has direct ties to fluctuating attitudes about the female body. Now, I want to be really clear and state once again that witches can be and are and have been people of all genders with any combination of body parts. And I hope I've made it obvious by now that I believe that trans witches and non-binary witches and male witches are all integral to the witchcraft community and have equal ownership over the identity of witch. That said, there is a specific history of cisgendered women being discriminated against, which is baked into the witch archetype. And so I wanted to give listeners the heads up that we'll be exploring that thread specifically on today's episode. During the witch hunts of the 16th and 17th centuries, the vast majority of the tens of thousands of people accused, imprisoned, or killed for practicing witchcraft were women. 
some estimate around 80% of them. And that's because a lot of the witch hunting pamphlets and manuals that were circulating in the area at the time described witches as being female, and it was their femaleness which many believed made them more susceptible to falling under the devil's influence. Some of you may be familiar with Heinrich Kramer's deeply misogynist text of 1486 called the Malleus Maleficarum, or the Hammer of Witches, which says that women are gullible and gossipy and stupid and untrustworthy and really, really horny. Which is why, according to Kramer, they were easier targets for the devil, who would then seduce them and turn them into witches. Kramer wrote, All witchcraft comes from carnal lust, which is in women insatiable. And it's interesting, too, when you think about how centuries later, it was believed that women were naturally more chaste and had low to no libido compared to men. So all of this is bullshit, of course, but these gendered beliefs are still used to shame and oppress women today, as we know. Anyhow, there are many scholars who now theorize that witch hunting was actually a way for society to keep women in check and rob them of their agency, and most crucially, to keep them as unpaid baby-making machines in order to increase the population, generate the labor force, and support what was then burgeoning capitalism. In Silvia Federici's groundbreaking book, Caliban and the Witch, Women, the Body, and Primitive Accumulation, she writes, quote, We must conclude that witch hunting in Europe was an attack on women's resistance to the spread of capitalist relations and the power that women had gained by virtue of their sexuality, their control over reproduction, and their ability to heal." Unquote. In other words, shaming women, suppressing their knowledge, and taking away their bodily autonomy was a key part of how people in power, particularly white Christian men, built the economy which they benefited from the most. And P.S., they did this not just to women, but to BIPOC people of all genders throughout the world for the same purpose. And we can argue that that is still happening today. And so a woman's ability to understand and honor her body is very much an act of reclamation and rebellion. And my guests on this episode, the Brujas of Brooklyn, specialize in using their magic to help cisgendered women do just that. But before we get to that, first, let's check and see what's come through on The Witch Wire. Who is it? Witches! Natalie writes, Hi, Pam. I love your podcast and am so grateful for the feeling of connection that it fosters to other witches near and far. I'm writing during a time of low magical energy in my life. I'm struggling to find the motivation to practice what I love, but it feels like grasping at smoke. A thought occurred to me and I'm wondering if there is historical or mythological precedent for what I'm feeling. I'm currently four months pregnant, and while the physical demands of growing a human are one big thing, is it possible that my magical energies are also being tapped to create my child, leaving me feeling depleted on several levels? 
Thank you for reading and for creating this lovely space. Hi, Natalie. Thank you for being here and congratulations on your pregnancy. That is such exciting news. Now, I'm not a mother myself, so I'm not speaking from direct experience here, but having had many, many, many friends who are mothers, I know that pregnancy can be a deeply magical time, but also a very exhausting time. And let's be honest, you're going through this at a time when the world is exhausted. I'm not sure where you live, but here in the Northern Hemisphere, it is also still the winter, which is a time of hibernation and turning inward. And oh yeah, we're still in the middle of a pandemic, which is emotionally and logistically quite challenging too. So I say all of this to remind you that there is absolutely nothing wrong with you right now in terms of your witchery. I understand that pregnancy can feel very tiring because physiologically your blood and calories and energy are building a person as we speak. And your spirit is also going through a transformation to get ready to be the mother of this child. That is all big, big, big on its own. But I also just wanted to affirm for you that a lot of people feel more low energy in the winter, physically and spiritually. And remember, those things are connected. Because we are nature, and we are tied to its cycles, plus dealing with everything else that we're all dealing with. Now, your email came through a little while back, so by my calculations, you are due in June, so hopefully things will be a bit easier on a global level by then. But no matter what happens, it's really important that you feel as nourished and rested as you can be right now. So I guess the main thing I just want to say to you is, cut yourself some slack. Even if you don't do any active magic making right now, you are still making magic and you are still doing enough and magic will be there for you whenever you are ready. If you're still looking to do something small, I would encourage you to maybe do a little ritual with some sort of mother deity that you feel a connection to if you feel the need to ask for blessings or protection for you and your baby and your family. You can also choose to just do something once every few weeks. It doesn't have to be every day. So maybe you want to plan on doing a little something for spring equinox and or Beltane, and or summer solstice. You get the idea. But I just want to remind you that witchcraft can be really simple. It can be as simple as breathing mindfully and giving thanks to spirit. It can be simple as lighting a candle or cooking a beautiful meal with intention. You don't have to do anything elaborate or terribly time-consuming, and you can make whatever magic you instinctually feel drawn to make right now. And if that's nothing, and all you can do is just take really good care of your body and your baby-to-be, well then guess what? That can be a magical act too. Remember, the charge of the goddess says, All acts of love and pleasure are my rituals. So using a special soap you love in the shower, or eating something delicious, or just saying thank you, thank you, thank you spirit for this blessing of creation, are all ways that you can connect to your magic. I hope that helps, and I'm sending you and your little one lots of love and pleasure and blessings. Now on to my guests. The Brujas of Brooklyn are Griselda Rodriguez Solomon and Miguelina Rodriguez. They are identical twin PhDs who are professors of the social sciences within the City College of New York. These Brujas merge the magic of ancestral medicine with sharp intellect, 
combining the physical, the mental, and the spiritual to help people become more fully integrated beings. Their platform provides the balm to help folks heal from internalized oppression, particularly women. And as certified kundalini and hatha yogis, these black Dominican sisters design multi-sensory workshops that provide sacred space for women of color to heal from womb imbalances. They've both authored academic pieces on the effects of racialized oppression on communities of color, Dominicans in particular, and their work has been featured in such places as Univision, Google, BuzzFeed's Pero Like, and Facebook, to name just a few. And they say that joy is their ultimate form of resistance. Griselda and Miguelina joined me from their homes in Brooklyn via Zoom. Dr. Griselda Rodriguez Solomon and Dr. Miguelina Rodriguez, welcome to the Witch Wave. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. I am so thrilled to speak with both of you. You are two identical twins who are brujas, and I have been such a fan of what you do. Dr. Griselda and I were both on the NPR show The Takeaway over Halloween, which is how I was first alerted to your beautiful work, and so I'm just absolutely thrilled to have you. How are you both doing today? Great. Happy Lunar New Year, right? We're recording on the Lunar New Year. Also, for clarification, Miguelina and I generally go by the Brujas of Brooklyn. Just anybody who's tuning in that knows us as the Brujas of Brooklyn, they're like, who? Griselda and Miguelina. So, yeah, it's the Brujas of Brooklyn. Yes, the Brujas of Brooklyn. So, let's talk about that word, Bruja. It's a word that I know lots of younger kind of millennial witches of Latinx descent have been taking on for themselves as a word of pride and power. I would love to hear you both speak about what that word means to you and when you started referring to yourselves as brujas. So hi, everyone. This is Miguelina. So just as a reminder, we're identical twins we sound alike more than we look alike. So from time to time, we'll just remind listeners who is who. So this is Miguelina or Miguel. That's a question that we get asked a lot in terms of the word bruja, which, and our rationale or reasoning for the use of it. First of all, since we were in middle school, or even elementary school, people would call us witches. Oh, you two have these weird names and you're a little peculiar. So they would, do you remember that? Like, <laughs> Yeah. Being called witches in elementary school. Then we go to college. I think my name is Griselda. (laughs) So (laughs) (laughs) one of the witches in Shrek, like Shrek two or three, her name was Griselda. And we were like, of course. It's a good witchy name. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But the Brujas of Brooklyn, the word Bruja, one of our good friends, he used to call us in college, the witches of Bushwick instead of the witches of Eastwick. Because again, Mm -hmm. it was something about us too and the way we presented ourselves So then when we built this platform and we started like dabbling with holding space for women and having retreats, we were the witches of Bushwick, then the Brujas of Bushwick, then the Brujas of Brooklyn. That's the way our technical name came about. But using the word Bruja, it's something that, yes, like around 2012, we started using it to hold space. But it's kind of a word Griselda and I have embodied for a long time. Mm -hmm. We grew up with brujas. Our aunts were medicine women. They dabbled with herbs, numerology. They interpreted dreams. Our mom has had different altars. So it's a word that has been embodied, but because of our Latinx, Dominican, Christian background, it was never spoken. Like you use the word bruja was like had negative connotations. And we've kind of used it the way I, I use it is like, I say it's a woman that's like unfuckable with. You can't control her, demean her. That's the word bruja for me, for us. Yes, I love that. Griselda, did you have anything to add? Yeah, that was a beautiful presentation with regards to new age brujas. And generally, we also know that we're talking about witches. Brujas is witch in Spanish. So we know that this witch archetype has been around, we can arguably say since 
the beginning of existence, right? So brujas are reclaiming an ancestry of something very old, very primal, and very much needed today with the divine feminine awakening. I think that the Spanish use of the word, there's layers to it, right? Because we're also embodying practices of decolonization and radical self-care that I think is rooted in our experiences as racialized women of color. Absolutely. So I would love to hear more about your background, where you were raised, and how spirituality was infused in your lives as little witches. (laughs) We have a peculiar trajectory in the sense that we were born in New York City in Manhattan and then moved to Dominican Republic when we were around six months old until we were around close to four. And since we turned four, we've lived in Brooklyn. So that's why we claim Brooklyn to be essential to our practice. And, you know, our upbringing was very magical and whimsical in the sense that we had really peculiar sleeping patterns. We used to sleepwalk and sleep talk and do like crazy things. And my mother was very much into traditional Afro-Dominican spirituality. So growing up, she will always have altars, like Miga stated, but we will always find just like weird things under our beds, rocks, a cup of water. And this was just my mother practicing her faith, even though, you know, she grew up Catholic. This was something that she grew up practicing. And we grew up in the 90s in poverty, socioeconomically, but spiritually never felt that. So because of the economic impoverishment, we grew up having to use our imagination a lot. Right. So Mm. playing with whatever resources we had, like, you know, Skelly, for anybody that knows that game is just putting wax on like the top of like a 25 cent juice cap and playing like a game on the sidewalk. We were just little witches always with big poofy hair and freckles. And we have a lot of chipped teeth. (laughs) You just meet us and you're just like, they're not striking, but they're not off-putting, but they're fun to look at and they're intriguing to be around. (laughs) I mean, I beg to differ in that I find you both to be extremely striking, incredibly beautiful (laughs) Uh people, but you know. Thank you. But I'm curious. So your mom was practicing, it sounds like she was weaving together Catholicism and also some kind of um, like indigenous Dominican rituals. Did she talk to you or have language for what she was doing? Would she ever describe herself as a bruja, for example? <laughs> this is this is Nige. So what our mom practiced was an Afro indigenous way of life, religion, tradition. It's called the 21 Divisions, La 21 Divisiones. And ironically, it weaves Christianity into these indigenous and African ways of life. So one, like a, a European white saint, like St. Barbara, for Catholicism means something else in these different traditions. You know, so this is what our mom was practicing. Did she have a language for it? No. As far as we know, it wasn't something that my mom ever, ever sat and spoke to us about. My mother would, I don't know, Gri, how you feel. I don't know if mommy will call herself a bruja now. I know it's taken her some time to kind of settle with the fact that we both have proudly embraced this word and this way of life. As far as in our home, our mother was not hiding this. I don't know how mm-hmm. it was to her churchgoer friends or to our families. But like Griselda said, we would find all types of things. I mean, I remember finding a Jericho plant and it, it scared the shit out of me. I mean, the Jericho plant, those that know what it is, it's pretty intimidating. And imagine, yes. as Griselda said, being a curious eight year old and going under your bed and you see a white. I remember it was a white. It looks like a freaking bowl. spider. And mm-hmm, I was like, mm-hmm. what is this? And she had altars in the bathroom. She had altars in her room. She would give us baths like uh, with flowers. We would go with her to get readings here and in the Dominican Republic. So it was never anything that was spoken. But there's a phrase in Spanish. I'll say it in Spanish and then it's English. Lo que se ve no se pregunta. Like what you see, you don't ask. It's there. It's very clear. And my mom and a lot of like older, especially immigrant parents, they're like, you young people and younger people and the younger generation, you want to know everything. You ask so many questions. Like they were very much into the mystical, which is cool. Mm -hmm. 
But I think that this generation is a little different because we're marrying that divine feminine, the mysticism, the mystery with a divine masculine. Like, but I want to know and I want to understand. So again, my mother wasn't practicing this in hiding in our home, but it was never something that she really spoke to us about. And being identical twins, did you have any kind of spiritual or mystical connections to each other? Do you feel like there's a magic to twinship? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is yes, this is like a proverbial question that we get asked. We, I mean, we've been asked <laughs> since I have reason. Like, if I hear her, do you feel it? The obvious answer is no, but the real answer is yes, in the sense that no, if you go and smack Mika's hand, I'm not going to feel it, but I can tune into her emotional body and feel when she's down, right? Like yeah. she can me. So I'll wake up some mornings or even her and it's like, like a witch is non-negotiable. You scan your day like, oh, and then you kind of like check into the body and you're like, but well, why am I feeling this? And then you scan and you're like, but this is good. This is good. When all factors have been called forth, then I'll look into her and she'll be like, yeah, we got into it, me and my boyfriend, or like I had a funky dream. and. The twin thing is very witchy. I have a six-year-old son and he's very much into Harry Potter, which I love, right? Yes. And I love how twinship is woven so much into the series because that's like a wink at the fact and the truth that twins have historically, ancestrally been very mystical because consider the fact, especially identical twins, like two entire whole ass human beings were created from the union of like a sperm and an egg. Like that's like, wow, when a human being carried those beings and birthed them to existence, there's something pretty profound in that. It is a huge hiccup as business partners, but <laughs> in what way? Oh, do you have time? I don't know if I we mean, have enough time in like, the podcast. It's like being in business with a husband and a partner, being in business with a sibling, being in business with a best friend. The lines sure. between the professional and the personal are blurred a lot. But when you have twins, it's like, whoa. But I think it calls for a dynamic union because Miguelina and I complement each other so much. Like when people say twins, they think that we're the same and it's like we are very alike and we are just as different. And I think that that really calls for a powerful platform that is the Brujas of Brooklyn. Yeah, the twin thing. And they are, how many we counted? Seven sets of twin in our family. What? Yeah. I knew about your aunts because you just posted on Instagram about your identical twin aunts, and they seemed quite magical, too. (laughs) Do you think the other twins of your family had some kind of magical practice as well, or is it hard to say? I mean, this is Miguelina. It's hard to say only because they're younger. They're very young. Like the ones that are alive, Gri and I are the oldest, right? Because they were two sets, those that we posted on Instagram. Wow, that I just I just <laughs> realized that that's that's a big charge. And then the ones that follow us are 17. So it's kind of like we have to wait and see. But I don't doubt that there is some magic, not only from being twins, but being twins in our lineage. I mean, one of them is going to Wesleyan and the other one may be going to St. John's on a full ride. So when we talk about the magic of witches, which I'm sure your listeners know, it's not just like. The winds are coming from the southeast and, you know, there's a a full moon in Gemini and we can read those attributes. But being a witch, like Miguelina implied, is also we show up as badasses in the matrix, right, in the real world with flaws and our own ways of processing that may not be the healthiest sometimes. But I think that I love this newer age resurrection of the witch as like a so-called modern person that just navigates through life in their own unique way. The twins, at least the ones that follow us are also just as magical, but like Miguelina and I at 17, we were already witches, but we just didn't know it. And when I look at them, Vero and Vicky, that's their name. I see that like, oh, I can't wait until, you know, their mm-hmm. Saturn's return when life serves them their ass on a platter. And then, you know, their birth into their <laughs> witchdom. <laughs> <laughs> One of our taglines or the tagline for our work is practical magic, right? It's alluding to what Gri was saying, just helping people with wombs, women understand that we all have exactly what we need inside of us already to deal with what we're already like working through in life. And it's helping people understand that like 
no one's coming, right? Mm. But he always says that like working moms. Working moms. <laughs> and you are your savior. You are your guru. You are your master teacher. You know, everyone else serves as guides and they are winks. Like when you meet people, it's a wink that you're in the right direction and you're going to be okay. But really practical magic is just helping folks understand that we have everything that we need inside. But I did want to touch real quick on the question about our connectedness and brujas. One thing that happens a lot and some people do not believe us when we tell them that it was not planned is Griselda and I will show up to a place separately and we will have almost the same exact outfit on or we will have like a complimentary like I'll wear polka dot shoes and she'll have a polka dot blouse. I'll wear an orange top with like jeans. She'll have like an orange bottom with a denim top. And people are like, you planned this or you spoke about your outfit. And it's like, no. Yeah. And obviously being academics, on uh, you know, the left side of the brain, we can say socioscientifically that the upbringing and the environment affects things like fashion and clothes. Yes. But it's bigger than that. It's being connected, even like having experiences like, Griselda will call me. I just had an experience with like a rude teller at Target. And I'm like, girl, oh my God, I just left Home Depot and I just bickered with the girl behind the register. And again, it's these moments where I know Gri and I are like on a parallel universe. We are like connected in the same exact time and in the same exact place. One of my favorite, favorite twin moments was For anybody that lives in New York and rides the train, you know that although New York is relatively small, it's very unlikely that you just bump into people. But And when it happens, it's like I'm on the L train going home and the door opens at a stop that neither one of us are usually on. Mm -hmm. Miguel walks into the train and we have on the same sweater that was like loud and, you know, you could notice it from across the room. And she walks in and we're just like, oh my God, and start laughing. I don't know if you remember that, Miguel. <laughs> yes. Black and white Joe Fresh sweater. Yes, That's I remember that. Moments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on the same wavelength. Well, on that note, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Dive into the magic of stories with an independent witch-owned bookstore. From occult how-to books to fictional tales, the Spiral Bookcase carefully curates stories that give you a glimpse through the worn spot in the tapestry and a chance to transcend reality for a moment or two. Explore magical books alongside a bewitching collection of candles, tarot decks, crystals, and ritual objects, all hand-selected for their wonder and enchantment. We have to support our indie bookshops right now more than ever, so please go on ahead and visit the Spiral Bookcase virtually at spiralbookcase.com or follow along on Instagram for recommendations, sneak peeks, and more from bookseller and owner Victoria. That's at Spiral Bookcase. Look, it's hard enough grappling with our own emotions under ordinary circumstances, but even more so when the world is going through massive collective challenges. I am so grateful for my therapist, and even though I've done sessions in person for years, I've been pretty amazed at how effective online therapy has been for me right now. And so I can heartily recommend better help, an online counseling service which can provide you with your own licensed professional therapist to talk to via video or phone sessions. So if you have anxiety issues like I do, or are dealing with depression, stress, trauma, grief, or even just day-to-day struggles with your relationships or your family, or just feeling like you're not meeting your personal goals right now, which let's be honest, has been very difficult for most of us these days. I really encourage you to reach out to the folks at BetterHelp. They will connect you with a counselor that you can start chatting with in under 24 hours. Now, a few things I really appreciate about BetterHelp is that it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, plus they offer financial aid to those who qualify, and they make it super easy to change counselors so you can find one that you really click with. Best of all, Witch Wave listeners 
that's you. Get 10% off your first month of counseling by going to betterhelp.com slash witchwave. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash witchwave. I believe that all human beings can benefit from therapy. I certainly have myself, and I'm so glad that it's becoming more accepted and more accessible to do so. So please pop over to betterhelp.com slash witchwave and find a great counselor to talk to. BetterHelp is confidential, convenient care, and you, my friend, deserve that. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with the Brujas of Brooklyn. So let's talk about this incredible platform that you've started. I know that you teach workshops and retreats that really tend to focus on the divine feminine. Can you talk us through what somebody might come to expect from your workshops and classes? This is Grisel that they, they're going to have a lot of fun. That is a guarantee and obviously fun in the context of healing, but we really curate experiences with a very elevated energy point because fundamentally what Miguelina and I do is that we do shadow work. I think we've come to terms with that, especially in 2020. And for anybody that knows, and I think that all witches, we're, we're so cyclical that we do all types, all aspects of existence. But us in particular, if we had to pick a lane, which the matrix, you know, divine masculine usually requires of us, it's divine shadow work. So because people are already coming energetically, knowing that they're going to be led to tap into really deep and sometimes painful parts of their subconscious, we create a very like light and beautiful container. The actual practice of our workshop is rooted in Kundalini yoga. So they should expect to sweat, to mm. work, to wake up the next morning sore, which we absolutely love. But in the end, all of that is culminated and the climax is a very deep and profound meditation of some sort, whether it's a cord cutting or whether it's what we call the depojo, which is like a word in like Caribbean Spanish, meaning to spiritually like cleanse or release. Clear. Clear. We do the moving, we do the sweating, we even twerk sometimes <laughs> to essentially get people physically embodied, right? grounded in the presence of who they are to then go really deep into some sort of meditation. I really miss those workshops in person, but we've been able to beautifully pivot where people still have that experience, just not in person. Sure, sure. And it seems to me like a lot of the workshops, and you've alluded to this already, but for those who aren't familiar with what you do, a lot of them do center on specifically, I'll just say like cisgendered women's bodily mm -hmm. experiences, right? And healing kind of trauma and stigma around the womb and the vagina and menstruation. Griselda, you're a doula, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about how you've come to be called to do this specific work around cisgendered women's bodies? So this is Miguelina, and I'll answer regarding our work, what we call woke womb work. And then Griselda can talk about her work as a birth doula and doing work of, around birth justice and injustice. The way we came about it, I'll be honest, it's hard to answer sometimes because it's not something that Griselda and I sat down and we were like, okay, so we're going to shift from academia and we're going to go into womb wellness. That's not how it happened. That's how I know that Griselda and I were meant to do this. That's why a lot of people, like what Griselda just said about the experiences that we curate for people when they come to our events, they leave and they're like, wow, that felt very authentic. I felt very grounded and held because we came about in a way that was very, very organic. Going back to the twin question earlier, Griselda and I experience things collectively. I mean, just because we're twins and our natal chart is almost identical, we experienced our Saturn's return together. And ours was intense, you know, starting from when we were about 27, 28, we experienced a lot of shifting, a lot of loss, a lot of growth though, right? In hindsight, and we had each other, we called each other, we shared a lot. And when we came out on the other side, we were like, yo, what about women that don't have this, that don't have the collective, that don't have someone they can call on? We are able to synthesize books that we've read and we're able to present it in a way 
right? That's not as academic or dense for people that need it and don't have maybe the time or the energy to sit and read through all of this. So our work came about very organic. And I think collectively, a lot of things happened that led us to focus on the womb. Our mom having a hysterectomy when she was only 51. Our mom had Mm. us a little later. She was 40. And by the time she was 51, she had a full hysterectomy and we were 11. And somehow we still remember like that not being a good feeling. Then when I was in my mid 20s, I was diagnosed with HPV and I had to have a leap, which is a little thin layer of my cervix was shaved off because I had precancerous cells. That led Mm. me to seek brujas like healers in the 21 divisions, that Afro-Indigenous way of life in the Dominican Republic. So it connected me closer to that way of life and to spirit, but it got me taking care of my womb, right? And then Griselda, you could share your experience with Mama Mu. She meets an elder that reined it in and really introduced us to womb work. And then I meet Queen Afua and I become her apprentice for a year. And almost simultaneously, it was like, all right, this is it. And you know, here we are. And then Griselda has a home birth and she becomes a doula. And that was like the icing on the cake. Yeah, that was wow. a, that was a wonderful trajectory. Really quick. I'm sorry, Griselda. I just have to share <laughs> this. This is the magic and like healers and seers. And I just recently shared this story, what I'm about to share. And I was like, wow, I, I didn't remember this story. And I shared it and it was it moved me and it moved people that were listening. So I get this leap done And I find this woman, my father used to go see this, this reader. She used to read water, like glasses of water, right? A seer. And I finally find her and I go see her and I'm shitting on my pants. I'm scared because it's new to me. Her room is like filled with saints and candles. Although I grew up with it, this was like on steroids, you know, it was on another level. And I walk in and she talks to me about my procedure. Like, why did you let them take a part of you? I could have helped you. And I'm like, who the fuck told this woman that? And then she tells Mm -hmm. me my drug of choice before I got deeper into my womb work, where Gri and I try not to take any sort of like medication when we're on our cycle. I used to take Motrin because my GYN told me, take a Motrin the day before your period and the day after your first day. So that way you don't get cramps. And she's like, why do you take so much Motrin that's eating away at your cervix? And I was like, how does this lady know this? Mm. Uh, Just to hone in like the power when you believe the power of this work. And that really just changed the trajectory of my life and then of of our work. Sorry, Giddy, I wanted to share that. Thank you. No, that's important, right? Because how many people, this may be triggering, you know, because it's about just like, Bodily autonomy, how many women have parts of their bodies captive by the medical industrial complex? How many people's cervix lining, uterus, placentas does this medical institution keep and have? And that's a profound wound that I think Miguelina in particular has a profound testimony about the ability to reclaim that power, right, spiritually back, even though you may not be able to reclaim the physical parts of your body. And I think uh, another almost like the little sprinkles on the cake to that trajectory of our now present work in womb work is my dissertation, my research on Black Dominican women being exploited like their bodies literally within a capitalist world economy. Really, for seven years of my life, I was just in Syracuse, New York with the Onondaga Nation, right? One of the strongest indigenous nations in the United States. And to me, the energy of that, I think, really helped to heal me learning about ancestrally how women's wombs were historically transformed into profit-making machines, whether it's European women during the medieval era to indigenous and African women, Asian women during, you know, the advent of the conquest and colonialism. And this is why our work, not only because we are cisgendered women, so we share from a very profound place of experience, but because when you look at history, You know, yes, trans folks have their own plight that I think is now coming to light more and more. And there needs to be even more conversations, particularly when we talk about the intersection of race, you know, and sexuality and bodily autonomy. But when you end, when you look at the history of like our modern world systems, it was mostly cisgendered women whose wombs were transformed into baby making machines, very crassly put. Mm -hmm. That's almost like a wound that's very particular. It doesn't make it better or worse. 
But we focused on that particular wound because it's almost like a lifeline within capitalism that has really caused immense psychic and physical wounds in the bodies of cisgendered women that I don't even think we've even touched the tip of the iceberg. And when you talk about the intersection of race, what that's done to women of color, we are now just dusting off the snowflakes. It's an important question that you asked us about the cisgendered aspect, because unfortunately, we're birthing and moving out of the Piscean age, but you know, that previous age had it that, you know, our existence was very absolute that if the Blue House of Brooklyn do work on cisgendered women, then that means that we don't care for trans women. Not saying that anybody has ever accused us of that, but we know that in the larger conversations on a national level, there's this implication that if there's a focus on cisgendered women, then there's an obliteration of trans women. And that's absolutely not what the Brujas of Brooklyn have done at all. Exactly. And I never picked up on that from you at mm-hmm. all, but I'm so happy to get to hear you talk about that and address it because it is a wider issue, I know. And it's something I contend with, too, when I'm talking about the witch and witchcraft. And it's like, you know, of course, I don't want to ever disclude or make anybody feel left out or feel like their struggle is not important in any way. But there still is healing around the cisgendered female experience Mm -hmm. that needs to happen too. And so it's, I think for, for people, and I think the three of us all probably share similar politics and stances around, you know, inclusivity and gender spectrums and things like that. I just think it's important that we acknowledge it and also try to figure out how we can still offer healing to anybody who needs it. And sometimes that means in really specific ways to specific populations, right? Yeah. Well, on that note, let's take another quick break and we'll be right back. Hey, Witch Wave listeners, it's Tess from Magic Monday Podcast. And this is Natasha from Magic Monday Podcast. And we have a podcast that we think you will like. It is for magical, metaphysical, witchy people like you. And right now we have over 200 five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts. Listeners have said that it makes them look forward to Mondays, that we're informative. They have said we're funny. Tess doesn't want me to say <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it. <laughs> they said it. And it's like hanging out with your favorite witchy friends. Yeah, so we tune into the energy of the week. We offer spells and rituals. We answer questions. And we talk to fascinating, magical people. We talk about everything from self-compassion to talking to dead people to astrology. So if you'd like to listen to us, you can go to wherever you listen to podcasts or visit our site at magicmondaypodcast.com. Would you like even more Witch Wave? Then come join us on Patreon, where you'll get bi-weekly bonus Witch Wave Plus episodes, ad-free Witch Wave episodes, and detailed show notes for all. Rewards also include magical merch and giveaways, early heads up about my workshops before they sell out, and all backers get access to our exclusive digital coven, where I lead monthly rituals and video chats, and where you can connect to a community of other wonderful witches. So head on over to patreon.com slash witchwave and sign up. It's a fabulous way to get more magic in your life and to support the show. Thanks so much. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with the Brujas of Brooklyn. So we were talking about your academic work, and I would love to hear how you integrate these different parts of yourselves. You know, you both work for colleges, for universities, you're doctors. You also are then calling yourselves very publicly Brujas. Is there any kind of tension that you've had to reconcile in your workspace in terms of holding these different identities or have things been kind of bifurcated and compartmentalized and, you know, you kind of don't let them touch each other? Quickly, this is uh, Miguelina. They definitely touch. The macaroni spoon is used to serve the beans and (laughs) (laughs) we definitely don't believe in compartmentalizing those aspects of our lives, but it did take time to iron things out. And for me, this is Miguelina, personally, COVID and this pandemic has made it 
where I am bringing a lot more of the spirit realm into the academic setting, where before I would bring more of the academic setting into the spirit realm, where what Griselda said earlier, when we hold space and we curated these experiences, we spoke about, for example, womb imbalances within the context of a patriarchal structure, within the context of a consumer-based capitalist society, like the one we're operating under. But I didn't necessarily equally bring the spiritual divine feminine into the academic. And then the pandemic hit. And honestly, I was like, fuck that. We're going to talk about God. We're going to talk about prayer. I'm going to tell my students I love them. I'm going to give them, you know, before I wouldn't share my Instagram because it was I was never ashamed. But I was like, you know what? For now, these are my students. I don't want them all up in my personal life. And I realized, especially last March, Gri and I were offering so much like medicine and holding space and connecting different people with different realms of healing that I was like, why am I keeping my students from this? And Mm. it's been a year. And now I feel like I have a nicer balance because what Gri said earlier, the Piscean age was one where you compartmentalize your lives and that works, but we can no longer do that. Mm -hmm. You know, we Mm -hmm. can't do that. And I think we have a nice balance now where we've been able to marry both. And I think we show up as academics in ways that people don't expect, where both of us have stories. We walk in and people are like, you're my professor? Because we show up with our big hair, our red lips, our door knockers, the way we dress, the way we speak. But then in the spirit realm, we show up in ways that it's like, are these women really? Red lips, door knockers. (laughs) Red lips, door knockers. (laughs) You know, we'll play Mm -hmm. like, Yeah, we'll play Kundalini meditation music and then we'll shift later that session and we'll play Cardi B and we'll play. Girl, you look good. Won't you back that ass up? (laughs) Perfect twerking (laughs) song. It's Griselda. I think that, Pam, going back to the, I think the first question you asked about the newer resurgence of the Bruja identity is that we're meddling in a lot of the gray area, like all new age witches are, right? In the sense that you're coming to experience what you think and is a womb wellness workshop And we know that womb imbalances are very much rooted in patriarchal domination. And then you come to us and we're playing, girl, you look good, won't you back that ass up, which could essentially be perceived as like an objectifying song to women. But Mm -hmm. we're traversing those different realms to say that there's medicine in both, right? And the medicine in that, when you can maybe tune out the song, is not to overlook the way in which women's bodies have been assaulted metaphysically, physically, spiritually speaking, but to know that when we can remove ourselves a little bit from the intensity of the way that patriarchy like disembodies us and we can get into our wombs and twerk to any song that incites that, that that's very liberating. So I think that one thing that allows us, like Mika said, to be more spiritual in the classroom and be more academic in the witch realm is that we've learned how to lose a lot of shame. Yes. I don't care if people perceive me as I'm prophesizing when I talk about God now, right? And I really don't care if people in the workshop think that, not that we don't care, you know, but like, it's one of those things that we're taking risk. We're taking big risk. And when you started asking the question pretty much about how do you all juggle so many hats, I had to chuckle because the first thing that comes to mind is like the exchange or the sacrifice is that we can be a little absent-minded, you know, like we'll lose keys or like, One of my favorite characters in the Harry Potter series, for anybody that knows, is Professor Trelawney. She's the one that teaches them how to read crystal balls, but she's fucking loopy. Like, she's perceived with, like, unkept hair, and she has the bifocals. She is my favorite character because I feel like, yeah, sometimes in order to navigate all these different realms, a little piece of you does have to kind of be floating somewhere off in space just to not allow all of these different hats to kind of like make us lose our minds. But then that's where our practice comes in. Yes. Because then I have a consistent practice where it grounds us to the point where we won't just float off. Yeah, we'll be like floating in the room, but we'll stay in the room. We won't float out into, you know, the abyss. Yeah. I mean, I'm not talking about going to black hole. (laughs) Right, right. Well, I think it's interesting to hear you talk about how sometimes you're occupying this more like ethereal space in the space of thought. And so much of your magic and medicine is around the body and being grounded. And for me, that's what makes witches 
pretty unique in the spiritual realm is just really honoring the body and bringing the magic to the material realm. We're not just trying to like meditate and get lost and, you know, cut ourselves off from the corporeal form and, you know, from matter, right? It's about infusing Mm -hmm. everything we can touch and who we are with magic as well and honoring the magic that's within us. And that's really what I get out of your work when I'm looking at what you're doing. It's really connecting the spirit to the body, right? Absolutely. That was beautiful, Pam. That was was so beautiful because it is absolutely what we, forgive me, no pun intended, embody in our work just understanding that although we, you know, that saying you're in this world, but you're not of this world, but mama, you're in this world. You can say that all Mm. you want. And you also have to understand that you are in this world. This is why what I was saying earlier with our workshops, Griselda and I would show up. And yes, sometimes we'll have our head wraps and long flowy skirts and beads. And some days, if it's the summertime, I'll have on a white, really short romper. Griselda will have a shirt, like showing a little bit of like her cleavage or pants that are like hugging our curves. Things that, again, women of spirit, especially the way we grew up in like the Catholic church and even in like the Afro-Indigenous way of life, seeing women show up in ways that was not that. I think that we understand that, again, we are still in this world and I can still wear a short white romper and I can twerk to like juveniles back that ass up and it doesn't make me less spiritual and less godly Mm -hmm. than a woman that may be showing up differently because that's one thing Gria and I we do our very best to not police women's bodies that's done enough come as you Mm -hmm. are and enjoy yourself and trust me if I had a camera to like just capture women's reactions when they come to our events and we're playing like hip-hop or reggaeton or Dominican dembo and then we 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 like drop into like some kundalini meditation because that's not what they were expecting but that is definitely what we are about because at the end of the day to like wrap that what I just said up with bringing the like spiritual into the academic and vice versa it's about saving lives like lives are depending on this and If we continue to compartmentalize, we're going to leave certain people out and, you know, we're going to keep them from something that may be very medicinal to them. Mm -hmm. If it's a situation where we're going to be more inviting to a woman because we may not be showing up in a way that's a little bit intimidating, then that's fine. But I'm also okay with sisters and healers and people that hold space that are like, no, when I hold space, I'm going to show up with my head wrap and my beads and my white and my long skirt. They're both okay. That's where the Brujas of Brooklyn are. They are both okay. I love that. And I think it's such an important point. And I can relate insofar as like my coven and I, we have a playlist that we all put songs into, you know, to like give us confidence and swagger and tap into our own, you know, power. And you know, it's everything. I mean, it's every genre you could imagine. For me, sometimes when I'm casting a spell, I play like certain Bjork songs mm. that like mean a lot to me and like really get me going. And and I do think there is a misconception that spirituality has to feel like really old and ancient and timeless. And that's beautiful, but it's also in the here and now and it's fluid, it's adaptable. And it sounds like that's your approach too. You're like, yeah, let me bring in my favorite song that was written, you know, a year ago and that's fine. Or, or that just hit, you know, the radio right now, the radio, listen to me as if, that, as if <laughs> such things yourself. exist anymore. <laughs> You're aging yourself. <laughs> oh, I know it. I know it. But I really love that. I really love that. There is room where we are practicing rituals and it's sacred. We also know like, don't play yourself and like, listen to that song with that vibration or don't show up like showing a certain body parts because the thing about the younger generations and we were just talking about dating ourselves but I'm speaking <laughs> from you know 10 years plus experience as a professor being an older millennial or what is it a zillennial as those That's, of us I'm a zil- I'm an exennial yeah, yeah like people need to learn time and place time and place So just like I said, oh, we'll play Cardi B and back that ass up in one of our events where we're practicing Kundalini Yoga. I will also understand that there's a certain vibration I'm trying to cultivate when I'm sitting in front of my altar or when I'm holding certain space. So again, it is time and place. 
I love that. And witches are shapeshifters, right? Mm-hmm. So we can change shape and we can adapt ourselves to meet whatever the moment needs. I, I really love that. That's beautiful. In our final few minutes together, I wanted to ask you about marrying spirituality and politics. Mm. <laughs> Do you think of the spiritual as being political and vice versa? Absolutely. Yes, Absolutely. yes, yes. This is Griselda. You know, I know it to be true because of the way history, especially U.S. history in particular, has used people's bodies to make money and to profit. And if we understand that witches, like you beautifully just said earlier, we're shapeshifters that are here to harness spiritual energy in a physical form. If your body is compromised because either you're a woman and the state wants to regulate what you can do with your womb, whether have an abortion or not, or whether be coerced into medical interventions while giving birth or not, then that tells you that your bodily autonomy is not accessible to you fully in order to channel that energy as clear as it possibly can be. So absolutely politics are tied into spirituality. And that's one thing that we are starting to see a shift in where a lot of collectives, brujas, entities, seers that have wanted to bypass these like very difficult conversations around politics, they're slowly being phased out because this newer generation is very hungry and in need of a level of healing that's multifaceted. Like they're woke, like Black Lives Matter, you know, they're woke like me too. And they also want to heal in a profound God-like way. So absolutely, absolutely. Even like accessibility to certain goods that will enhance your practices we're granted that access because of the fact that we live in a modernized nation like the United States. A Bruja in Dominican Republic, she is utterly blessed because they can go out to the bush and get the herbs or they can go to the beach and do their ceremonies. But when it comes to like access to things like candles and even matches, I'm being very trivial, but very, very real, a phone for Zoom workshops during a pandemic, They don't have access to those things because of geopolitics that leads a country, let's say like DR, to be economically impoverished. So absolutely, absolutely spirituality is politicized. Yeah, yeah. I think that's great. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I did. I think that independent of calling ourselves Bruja, which I think that as women, as people of color, queer folks, trans folks, poor working class people, our bodies are political. You know, as a woman of color, independent of calling myself a bruja, and this is what I help my students understand, every decision you make is political, right? Because where you live is going to affect the types of foods you have access to, the type of medical care, more importantly, the type of schools your children will attend. So all of that is political. And then when you add on top of it, for Griselda and I, we are calling ourselves a word that has been so just demonized and used to dehumanize people, it gets even more political because as Black women, as Afro-Indigenous Dominican women, this is a way that we're reclaiming our power, right? By using a word that's so magical and empowering, which the system has tried to dismantle because they know, the system knows that, again, a bruja is someone that's unfuckable with. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the universe will have it that Griselda and I, like a lot of people who are listening right now and maybe know who we are, the majority of you probably found out who we are last June when we held a three hour Instagram live to discuss like colorism and discrimination, anti-Black sentiments within the Dominican community. So our quote unquote, and these are big quotes because I I don't mean anything to be pompous. Our claim to fame was this extremely political conversation that we had back in June, but it was definitely laced with the spiritual elements, something as trivial as like, we're burning sage on that live to Griselda leading us into this beautiful meditation to ground us at the beginning to, you know, remembering that at the center of these conversations around activism and social justice is love. And that's very spiritual Mm. because spirit, love, God, for me, it's all one and the same. So absolutely the spiritual is political for Griselda and I. Oh, so beautiful. So beautiful. 
Well, I admire the work that both of you are doing so much. I'm so happy that our paths have crossed. Before we go, I'm sure there are going to be people who would love to learn more about you, love to hear about how they might be able to get involved with any workshops or retreats that you're doing remotely or in person, hopefully, Mm -hmm. (laughs) in the not too uh, far future. How can people find out more about the Brujas of Brooklyn? Yeah, Brujas of Brooklyn across all platforms, B-R-U-J-A-S, Brujas of Brooklyn, Instagram, Brujas of Brooklyn, Facebook, brujasofbrooklyn.com. We even got a little medium account where we flex our little writing muscles beautifully. So brujasofbrooklyn.com. I also wanted, this is Miguelina, I wanted to invite folks, Griselda and I hold 40-day kundalini yoga sadhanas. So a sadhana is a spiritual practice that you do every day for 40 consecutive days. And we're in the middle. We're on day 33 of a sadhana that we're doing to heal inner anger. We did inner rage back in November of 2020. And the next one will be will start in the uh, spring equinox. So sometime in mid-March. So if this sounds something that's appealing to you, we offer videos to walk you through the process. It's a 15 to 20 minute daily meditation. And we provide a private Facebook group, WhatsApp chats. So it's like virtual space that we're holding for you to help you finish your 40 consecutive days. So that's one of the more recent things. Griselda, I don't know if you could think of something that we have coming up. I wanted to ask, actually, getting back to our earlier conversation about how there are some specific classes and workshops and communities that are closed. They're just for certain segments of people. Are are these workshops that you're talking about, these retreats, are they open for anybody? Or did you want to be a little bit more specific about who you think that, you know, would most benefit from this work? They're open to everyone. We have had events that are only for women, for people with wombs. This, what I just mentioned, the 40-day Kundalini Yoga Sadhana is open to every and anyone. Perfect. Thank you so much, because I just know that there are going to be lots of listeners who might not have wombs, who might want to get into what you're doing, too. So that's good to know about that specific one. Beautiful, beautiful. I can't thank you both enough Mm -hmm. for being on The Witch Wave. I can't wait to learn even more about what you both do. And I just wish each of you health and happiness and lots of magic and lots of love. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for the show. Thank you again to the Brujas of Brooklyn for sharing their Bruja brilliance and twin twerking with me. Do you have questions, feedback, need some witchly advice, or just want to share something magical that happened to you recently? Drop us an email at witchwavepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you, and you just might make it on the witch wire. The Witch Wave is produced, written, and recorded by me, Pam Grossman. This episode was edited by Rachel Jacobs, thank you, Rachel, and myself. Our sound engineer was Josh Wilcox. Our theme music is the song Hand and Eye by Lycanthia. Special thanks go to Matt Freeman, Laura Antal, and Cece Pascal. You can check out information about this and other episodes on our website and now buy Witchwave merch at witchwavepodcast.com. And you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and give us lots of sparkly stars if you please. It really does make a difference and helps other people find the show. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at witchwavepod. And you can check out my witch emoji for iPhone by going to witchemoji.com or downloading it in the App Store. And please consider picking up my book, Waking the Witch, which is available everywhere now. And if you want more Witch Wave or you would just like to support the show, please do join us over on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash witchwave. Thank you so much for listening. Witches are the future. I'll catch you next time on The Witch Wave.